Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India continuing on our module on um, architecture and the basics of uh, Buddhist and uh, Jain architecture. So, uh, we have already covered the impact of the Mauryan uh, empire and uh, especially looking at uh, Ashoka's rule and how that made a huge impact on the way in which we understand Buddhist arch architecture today. And the, of course, their, their, their impact on um, this particular uh, land capital that we see as the symbol of the Republic of India today. Now, from there, if we move further, we find that after the Mauryan rule, there was a of the Shungas that was there in the 2nd and 3rd century BC. And then afterwards, we find that there were the rules of the Kushanas. The Kushanas were the ones who came from Central Asia. And we find that, I mean, they were, they ruled from Northern India. So, the, in, during this time period, we find that two cities came into two regions, I'd say that, I mean, that came into prominence. One will be the area around Mathura that is in the state of Uttar Pradesh today and then the other part will be the Gandhara which is part of northern Pakistan today. So, these are the two sites we find that I mean that came into prominence during the rules of the Kushanas and uh, during this time what we find that I mean this these two different places even though there are a number of Buddhist sculptures and uh, architectural practices that we find to be prevalent during this time but we find that I mean during this uh, during these times even though um, the sites of Mathura and Gandhara these places were uh, developing simultaneously but there was a tremendous amount of uh, diversity in terms of how how material was uh, used and how the Buddhist images and, and the architecture was constructed. So, we will start the discussion with the images that we find in the Gandharan region. So, Gandharan region as we know for its political, I mean for its uh, geographical location as well as for the political relations with, uh, with, the, with the Greeks. Who, who were active there and then uh, with also with its proximity to the Silk Route, this historic Silk Route which connected China and northern part of India to um, uh, Europe. So, th for this these things we find that I mean uh, a very uh, specific kind of image making practice that came into prominence in the Gandharan region and some of the examples will be the ones we have on screen. So, for example, we find that I mean the region of Gandhara, it started being developed from the 2nd century BC and then it was developed further until 5th century AD. So, it was a long time period in which we find that this place was active. Now, we do not really have the Kushanas uh, ruling these places between like 2nd century BC and 5th century AD. They were active in the 2nd and 1st century um, BC. However, this image making practices and different kind of sculpture and architecture making practices, they persisted in this region and they flourished with time. Now, if we see some of the characteristic feature of this uh, the Gandharan sculptures, the one we have on screen in the left side, we have an image of Bodhisattva. Now, what is a Bodhisattva? We have already looked into the idea of Buddha who is this enlightened one and uh, the, who was a human being who uh, was a prince from this um, from the site of Kapilavastu and then he um, embraced the path of asceticism and then uh, attended enlightenment at the site of Bodh Gaya. Now, the Bodhisattvas as Buddha had already said that I mean uh, he is not the only person who had attended enlightenment. There had been many other uh, people who had 
had been Buddhas in the past and there will be people in the future who will also be Buddhas. So, he did not make his position as an exclusive one and he also made an, a claim that I mean all the people around us, everyone who are on the path to self-discovery can be understood as Bodhisattva. So, he, Buddha's previous words are considered to be that how he was born as Bodhisattvas and he uh, followed the righteous path. Uh, so, those are the ones which we also find in the Jataka stories which have been very popular in the Buddhist context. Now, the Bodhisattvas in the Buddhist context uh, even though Buddha had considered everyone who is in the path of self-discovery can be considered as Bodhisattva. However, as the Bodhisattva as a Buddhist deity when we see in the in this context mostly in the Mahayana context, we find that Bodhisattvas are considered to be the ones who had the knowledge of enlightenment, but still they did not leave the earth and only to help the people who are around us to attain enlightenment, to be conscious and to be uh, liberated. So, this is the reason what we find that I mean the Bodhisattvas are considered to be the ones who are the compassionate ones, who are the ones who have compassion towards all the living beings in the earth and they help everyone for attending enlightenment or being on the righteous path. So, this is the this is the reason what we find that the bodhisattva figures they are considered to be uh, this compassionate ones and uh, this empathy in their face and their bodily gestures are also something that is portrayed in the sculptures. The other feature that we also find in the bodhisattva sculptures is that the bodhisattva sculptures are usually been shown as royal figures as opposed to the monk like figure of Buddha. That is also a major distinction that we can make between the bodhisattvas and Buddha. Now, here what we find is that there is a high degree of naturalism, something that we have already seen in the Mauryan time, but that had also been developed further. But in this case, what we find that there the naturalism, what is evident here is slightly different from the ones which we have perhaps uh, been existing in the Indian subcontinent. But this, this high degree of naturalism also comes from um, the study of anatomy from the European context and from the Greco-Roman context because of their relationship with the Greeks in this region of Gandhara. And that is the reason what we find that uh, the, the proportion of the body, the, all the features of the eyes, the nose, lips and so on, all those ones are done not only by looking into the, uh, you know, the, the beauty standards of this time or like the iconographic features of this time, but also how it can respond to the conventions of anatomy in the Greco-Roman context. So, that is the reason what we find that I mean these figures, they look very close to the ones which are created in the Greco-Roman context in Europe and also the details that we have in their uh, body for example, how the, um, the drapery or the fabric that, that flows in from the shoulder to, to their waist and so on. So, those are the ones which are done with utmost care, which is not stylized at all and they are very much uh, naturalistic the way we find them in the um, in, in our um, surrounding. So, something that we can closely associate with the Greco-Roman sculptures during the same time. What else we also find that I mean there are those the features, the physical features which also look like I mean they are from the particular region which is this bordering region between South Asia, Central Asia and, and a part of the Middle East. So, that is the reason we find that I mean the physical features and so on and the facial features they also respond to this region. However, that said we also find that certain kind of iconographical traits. So, for example, uh, the urna or, or the or this particular um, you know the, this, this mark on the forehead of Buddha and the Bodhisattvas that is present here and then like I mean something that is there as a halo behind his head which marks 
his divine presence. So those are the other features that we also find here. And then what else we also find are those very important hand gestures. So as we have started to address that there are some of the hand gestures or mudras. So for example, the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra in which we find that I mean Buddha had touched the earth for being for bearing the evidence of his enlightenment or the other one will be the dharma chakra pravartana mudra which we have here featured in this bodhisattva sculpture as well and then the other mudras we also find those those we can perhaps um, continue to talk about in the mathuran context now so if these are the kind of like sculptures that we find they are the ones which are made from this local cyst stone so that is a big difference in terms of how we have studied mostly the sandstone sculptures from the northern India and this one for its the geographical dif uh, difference. So we find that cis stone is used which is little more easier to carve I'd say that I mean from sandstone and that also gives us this uh, liberty of implementing more details there. And then it is believed that I mean in some cases the cis uh, the cyst stone sculptures were covered with um, um, stucco like um, uh, layers and stuccos are made of uh, the, the stucco layer is made of lime plaster and hay and some kind of gum or additive material and so on and that became a smooth paste which was applied on the top of the sculptures and for having much more clearer details and the the intricacy that cannot be achieved on stone and then those sculptures were painted. So in some of the sculptures we do have uh, marks of this stucco and for its material character in some cases we do not have the stucco that is existing anymore but in some cases we do find the marks of the stucco the remnants of those materials as well as we also have marks of the paint from which we can uh, imagine that all the sculptures that we see them or the ones that we have on screen they were uh, initially been covered with this lime plaster and then they were painted to have this very lifelike um, appearance. Now the other um, sculpture that we have on screen and that is um, that is a stair riser. So that we can imagine that I mean this is a stair riser that comes from 1st century AD and from the Gandharan region in northern Pakistan and it, this was perhaps been part of a stupa. So even though we are seeing it as a re relief or a panel like a, like a sculpture but it was initially been part of a architecture and that would be a stupa. So here the stair riser is basically like how there are the stairs for if there is a if there is a particular platform on the top of that there is a stupa. So the visitors or the devotees will require the stairs to climb up to this platform and circumambulate the stupa. So for those places we find that the in the stair riser this kind of sculptures were there and uh, it was found in fragments so we do not know the scale of this stupa or this particular site from which it was found. However, if we see some of the details those have been added to this, this particular panel in the stair riser, we find there are the river gods which are like I mean um, they are they either look like boatmen or they are the river gods and this particular way of depiction of the figures, their muscles and their anatomy and so on all these are very much a clear evidence of how the Greco-Roman uh, sculptures and the Greco-Roman visual culture and art that made a huge deal of influence in the sculpture and architecture making in the Gandharan region. And again this is made from cyst stone which is um, again it is a difference from how we have studied the ones in northern India. Now from there if we move back to northern India to the site of Mathura where we see that there was also a flourishing center during the Kushana period 
and this is another uh, sculpture that we find that that comes from first century as i have said that i mean this uh, the sites of gandhara and sites of mathura they had been developing simultaneously so here what we have there is this a uh, very different form of buddha and this buddha figure is made uh, in high relief in which like i mean we see that i mean the figures are almost in round they are almost free standing but they are still attached to a background and the background we can see that there had been a huge um, you know hello behind their head which also makes it a kind of um, you know a back support so it is not just a hello for the religious purpose but it is also for uh, giving the sculpture stability and this is made from a sikri sandstone sikri sandstone or the mathura sandstone that we have there that i mean the slightly the reddish one or the mathura one we we, we we have like i mean either the reddish sandstone we find or the gray or the slightly yellowish one we find so those are the different kinds of sandstone we find and uh, what we have here in mathura that i mean the the making of the sculpture of buddha even though we are dealing with the same deity even though we are dealing with the same iconographic conventions but we find that the the regional standards of beauty perhaps as well as that i mean how figures how human beings how deities were perceived by the artisans in mathura was quite different from the way we see in the gandharan context so here what we have that i mean buddha is this majestic figure who sits on this simhasana or this lion throne and uh, buddha has been considered to be the shakya simha or the lion of the shakya clan so that is the reason we always find uh, in many representations we find that buddha is represented on simhasana or the lion throne so in this lion throne we also have script which perhaps uh, uh, describes it further about the uh, uh, about its dedication as well as the um, details of the uh, the people who have who have uh, commissioned it and so on and what the other things that we find here is this the the depiction of the eyes the depiction of the facial features and so on they are somewhere in between um, the the naturalistic depiction as well as the idealistic one so for example the lotus like eyes the eyebrows which are joined as a as a bow and then all those different features that that we find to be part of the iconographical convention they have been implemented here in a different way from the ones we have studied in the gandharan context now we also have there are two other figures who are the attendant figures uh, who are by the two sides of buddha and buddha has his right hand raised in the posture of this abhaya mudra or the posture of uh, reassurance so the uh, the when the palm is raised like this this is considered to be this abhaya mudra which uh, or which is also considered the fear not gesture in which the deity assures the devotees that whatever happens the devotee will be there to protect the deity will be there to protect the devotees and that is something that we also find to be um, represented in many of the buddha sculptures so here we find the buddha's figure to be almost like a majestic ruler as opposed to the empathetic one that we have seen in the gandharan context it is not the case for all the sculptures that we find in the mathuran uh, region however this is one of the significant ones that we find that how this uh, really um, you know well built and majestic ruler like figure that is buddha who is represented in this form now the other thing we also find to be this flowing drapery which almost disappears in the body and that is something that we find it also responds to the geographical region that uh, northern india is in because of its summer and this high heat we also need the clothes which will be lightweight and which will not be heavy as the one that we perhaps see in the gandharan context and that is the reason there are this certain um, features or certain this features or or the or this peculiarities that we find they were prevalent in part of the mainland india which will perhaps 
talk about the, the geographical and the climatic condition in these regions as well. So from there we also find that I mean how this particular way of image making had also made a huge deal of impact on the, um, on the making of uh, the stupas. So we have already spoken about the Sanchi stupa but before that there was also this other stupa which is again in Madhya Pradesh, Bharut and in Bharut what we find that there was this ingenious way of making this massive architectural structures and those uh, relied on the use of the lintel and the pillars. So like I mean we have the bars, the horizontal bars and the vertical columns and how they were brought together in the railings that we have. So these massive railings which were made from granite stone which is another very hard uh, stone which, as opposed to uh, the one we, we have in sandstone. So in Sanchi we have the sandstone sculptures and uh, then uh, what we have that I mean how this stone also makes a, a difference in terms of how uh, this the sculptures are produced on the top of them. Now for both Bharat and Sanchi we also find how these places perhaps that I mean there are some of the inscriptions that suggest that the Sanchi stupa was originally erected by Emperor Ashoka and uh, but it was later renovated. So during the Shunga period we also find that the Sanchi stupa was rebuilt and during this time it was not just one person who contributed to making the stupa but it was a group of people. So for example the royals, the merchants and so on, they will uh, contribute to making this stupa, this elaborate gateways around them and so on and that is the reason we find that I mean this stupa complexes were not been built at the same time but they were periodically built and the site of Sanchi we find that I mean that was active from the 2nd century BC or 1st century BC to at least until 12th century AD. So that was a long time in which we find that I mean the sites were very uh, relevant. Now here we have not only uh, uh, an image of the railings from Bharat but we also have some of these really interesting medallions where there are those narrative scenes in which we find the, the worshipping of the Dhamma Chakra or the worshipping of the capitals or the pillars. So for example the one we have here this is clearly an Ashokan pillar with this, this uh, lotus and then the animal and on the top of that there is this chakra and we have the devotees in both sides how they are worshipping it. So some of the things that I mean those are missing from the Ashokan pillars like for example this chakra that we can uh, reconstruct their history by looking at this kind of sculptures. So from there if we come back to the Sanchi stupa we find that I mean as part of the Sanchi stupa since in the stupa there are no place for uh, decoration. So uh, that, that is something that had been uh, because I mean for the Sanchi stupa we find that I mean it was made with uh, stone and brick and it was perhaps been plastered. However, there are no other uh, sculptural um, elements those, those are added on the body of this hemispherical dome. Now since those things were not present we find uh, the need for narrating the stories from the Jataka or from Buddha's life those were been conveyed in this elaborately made gateways of Sanchi and we here we have the northern gateway of the Sanchi the, the great stupa at Sanchi and that was made during the first century BC. Now another thing about Sanchi it was the uh, it is a site which is which is around 30 kilometers from Bhopal as I have said earlier and this is a site where there were stupa I mean it is not just one stupa which had the relic of uh, Gautama Buddha but there were many other stupas where perhaps some of the memorial stupas were there and some of the stupas might have contained relics of the important Buddhist monks and nuns. Now, those stupas were there and they were side by side with the monasteries and the places of learning and education. So life and death continued at the same place. There was not really a division between the place which were dedicated to the, uh, to the dead ones and the ones who are the living ones. 
And what happens in this northern gateway that we find here is this there are tremendous amount of details in which the narrations from Buddha's life and from the Jataka stories have been conveyed. So, we have how uh, th there are those narrative panels which run horizontally and almost like in a way how the scrolls are been shown. So, like I mean the painted scrolls how they are opened, they are unfolded and then they are folded again. So, almost like that fashion is continued here how they also narrate the stories. And if we also pay attention to how the figures they are also been shown. So, the central figures for example, here the figures of these mighty elephants, they come to the, the, uh, the center of this, uh, this, this panel where there is this uh, depiction of a tree which is perhaps the Bodhi tree. And then like I mean there are also some of the other uh, elements in which we find how the animals they are been shown, they always point to the center and that is where the object of veneration, the Bodhi tree or any other symbol of Buddha is there. Now, apart from those things, we also find something ingenious and those are the brackets here and these brackets are also called Shala Vanjika and these are the Shala Vanjikas are the ones in which we find there is a woman, she holds the, the, a branch of the Shala tree and she places one of her legs, uh, one of her foot on the uh, roots of the Shala tree and this is a sign which had been considered that I mean it can be a, a symbol of Queen Maya who was Buddha's mother and um, who also gave birth to Buddha in this particular posture, but it is also something that is considered to be a particular kind of ritual in which the women they would uh, be associated with a flowering and uh, a flowering tree or a blossoming tree in which life, prosperity and fertility are uh, symbolized and uh, they, they are implemented. So, th and this is a particular sculpture that we also find that I mean this is, this is very tactfully placed in this particular area to support the horizontal bars and this, this particular way in which the sculptures are made that makes the use of an architectural bracket, but it also serves as part of the, um, the sculptural need as part of it. So, architecture, sculpture, narration and their usability in, in the entire structure, all these things we find them to be running together simultaneously. So, if the needs of the architecture is covered, it is not like the narrative needs are ignored. So, all those needs are taken care of by the artisans in Sachi, that is what we find and that is also something that we find to be that which contributed to um, the, the appreciation of, of this particular structures. Now, the other thing that we also find that there are many different ways of narrations which are implemented in these structures. So, for example, here we have how there are con continuous narrations that I mean the narration continues in these forms and even here like I mean there is a journey of, of Emperor Ashoka that we find that has been uh, depicted here and how the figure of Emperor Ashoka that not only appears once, but multiple times in the same horizontal panel to show there is a progression of this narrative. So, if there are this kind of narratives, this continuous narratives that we find there and then there are also the other kind of narratives for example, the image of the Buddha or the worshipping of the of this Ashokan pillar. So, that, that shows a very different kind of a single scene narrative. So, all these different strategies were also implemented as part of these structures. Now, at the end I also wanted to address that I mean how the spread of Buddhism was not limited to part of uh, central and northern India and then there was this very significant stupa that we find in the place uh, Amravati. So, Amravati is today in the state of Andhra Pradesh and uh, they, in that area we find that it was not just one side, but there were many sides which came into prominence. So, for example, Amravati, Ghantashala and then uh, Fanigiri and Nagarjuna Konda and so on. And here what we find that they used limestone, white limestone which almost looks like marble and then those white limestones were used for making this great stupa at Amravati. Now, this site had also 
uh, been, been in the ruins and many of these artifacts had been uh, collected uh, either in the government museum Chennai or mostly in the British Museum in London. So, some of the ones which we uh, see them, they are all in fragments and some of the fragments like the one we have on screen that sort of shows the amount of details and the grandeur of this particular structure. So, going with the depiction that we have here, here the stupa structure is not just unadorned, uh, but there are sculptures already on the body of this stupa and perhaps there is a sign that I mean there was a long tall standing figure of Buddha that was also made part of this um, you know that was worshipped in, in this particular structure. So, this kind of different ways in which we find that how Buddhist architecture had flourished in different parts of the Indian subcontinent though there are some of the similarities, but there were also the regional additions which enriched the, the making and the flourishing of Buddhist art and architecture in the Indian subcontinent.